Welcome to Management 591, Managing Human Resources. Today we'll start in talking about Chapter 1. I'll share some of my thoughts and uh, when you do your write-ups I'll hear what you were able to glean from Cassio. Uh, my thoughts will come from both Cassio, I'll comment on some of the things that he said and highlight some of the things that I really agree with and uh, occasionally some of my comments will come from my work experience and my other research. So, chapter one is uh, human resources in a globally competitive business environment and I like the fact that Cassio points out that managing people is a critical role for every manager. I completely agree with that. As a manager you, won't, you certainly will be managing numbers, budgets, sales figures, profits, but the means to getting those numbers and achieving those results are through people. So a big part of your job, unless you have a very unusual management job, will be managing people. And even if you're an individual contributor who works independently and doesn't manage employees, you will be working with others and you will be able to have an effect on the management of human resources and the HR practices in your organization. So. Chapter 1 has some good material. This course should have some material that will be beneficial to you in your career. If you think about it, picture a situation where all employees decided to stay home on a typical work day. Rather than going to work, they decided not to go to work. And they continued to decide that. They never went back to that company. The company, in essence, would cease to exist. Yes, it would exist on paper but the company would no longer exist. So organizations, for example, corporations are social constructions. They really are an artificial entity that does not exist without the people that constitute those organizations. So obviously managing people effectively is going to have a huge effect on an organ, uh, organizational effectiveness. And that's what this chapter kind of introduces us to that fact. Another topic I'd like to touch on is does effective human resource management or effective HRM, does it matter? We know that it does and this chapter provides some support for that, even some quantitative support which I'll get to a little, in a few minutes in this presentation. Um, I have in the past read some research suggesting that MBAs tend to be skeptical of so-called soft topics, and I think the research articles I read had focused more on the subject matter of organizational behavior, but I'm certainly uh, human resource management could fall into that category as well. I haven't noticed that among my students at CSU Pueblo, and I'm happy that I haven't noticed that. These so-called soft subjects like organizational behavior or human resources, I think by soft they mean it's not as focused as no on numbers and measurables, maybe like a finance class. Um, these softer courses are just as important as the so-called harder or more quantitative courses. And uh, research does support the fact that uh, HRM practices do matter, they do affect organizational results. I think um, also while profits and results certainly are essential. It's important to not lose sight that quality of work life is important and uh, there's a green breakout box in uh, chapter one that's worth taking a look at and it does indicate that if organizations don't pay sufficient attention to quality of work life they will tend to see, I forget how Casio phrases it, see the backside of their employees as they walk out the door. So. I think quality of work life is important for employee retention, but also just human happiness. Um, so I tend to be in the camp that both profits and people are important. Obviously, if you don't make profits, uh, if it's a for-profit organization, that organization is going to cease to exist, which generally is not a good thing. Employees depend on their jobs. Um, a lot of good comes from profit, from effective organizations. So. That's not good for anybody when an organization doesn't stay competitive, doesn't focus on results, and uh, gets beat in the marketplace and goes out of existence. So certainly profits are important, but people are co-equal important. 
an organization that's unethical or terrible to work for, I really don't think the world is a better place for that organization existing. So I think really I'm hoping that as managers you all will have a focus on both, you know, results and people. And I think it's quite a significant managerial contribution to promote uh, quality of work life and be a decent boss and a good human being to work for. I like how uh, the chapter touches on the fact that human resource management involves causes and effects, interrelationships, um, variables, uh, causal loops of influences, and I think um, Cassio gives a good example of how human resource needs interrelate with his uh, description of that situation with the Hand Corporation. He talks about how they had an unexpectedly large number of retirements at this Hand Corporation and he traces through the various uh, effects of that and the responses that this organization took. Uh, you might read that carefully. It's kind of important to think about these things um, as systems with a number of effects and variables that need to be managed. So, to be a little more specific, the early retirements at this hand corporation meant that they were going to have to recruit a lot of people to replace the retiring employees, but they realized that with changes in their business, changes in their industry, uh, they were probably going to need some slightly different skill sets than they had needed in the past. So the first effect was that uh, some job analysis was going to be necessary. So rather than just retirement and hiring replacing, you can already see one uh, avenue that this organization realized they needed to follow, and that was analyzing the work, analyzing the job to identify knowledge, skills, and abilities that would be needed among the employees that would be selected into those positions. That would be followed by the recruiting that was necessary, so they were going to have to up, probably update their recruiting practices. They were going to have to update their selection procedures because anytime you identify new knowledge, skills, or abilities, you've got to figure out how to assess whether applicants for these positions possess those knowledge, skills, and abilities. So they were going to have to revamp their selection practices. I like the fact that uh, Cassio notes compensation practices were going to have to be reviewed. With these new jobs and these new sets of job content, you kind of have to price that in the marketplace. People doing this set of tasks, what would that be worth in the marketplace? And what's it going to take to retain these people compensation-wise and to motivate them? Training and development. Obviously, these new employees coming in are going to need training. They're going to need orientation, probably some coaching and mentoring. So training them how to adapt to the organization and uh, perform these jobs is going to be essential. And then. Uh, Lastly, it's mentioned that you have to think about effects on current employees, so the employees that are not retiring. You've got all these changes going on, these newcomers coming in, there's going to be ripple effects from that. So we're going to have to, as an organization, think about how to help these existing employees adapt to the changes. Maybe uh, innumerable things might be needed to help, but an example would be, you know, could you coach or train the current employees on how to assist newcomers, reduce newcomer stress, coach and mentor newcomers? Um, so just a, quite a lot of string of events resulting from the early retirements. It points out that changes in any single part of the system can have a reverberating effect on all other parts of the system. So quite a nice example. The thing is, when it's in a textbook, this all makes sense, right? Certainly you would think through all this. I know from, and you probably know as well or better than I do when you're a busy manager, um, sometimes you don't have time to think through all these causal loops. I'm calling them the causes and effects. And um, so this is a good example that it is important to break out of the firefighting, take a little time, find some quiet time, and think about how one incident 
or event, uh, what it entails, what all it's going to affect, and how to most appropriately respond. I think Cassio talks about, um, he mentions that a broad objective of human resource management is to optimize the productivity of all workers in an organization. I really like that characterization. It's quite simple, quite short. Um, so coming up with a short synopsis like that is difficult, but I think that's a pretty good one that, uh, you know, if we can optimize the productivity of all workers in an organization through our human resource practices, that's quite a contribution. And it kind of makes me think, I've heard uh, on various occasions that the United States Marines, the Marine Corps, the way that uh, they characterize it, is that the job of every person in the organization, in the, in the Marines, is to support the frontline soldier. So the troops that are doing the fighting are on the front line. Everybody's job is to support them from the t highest level generals in the Pentagon on down. They're thinking of that uh, frontline worker. So I really think that uh, that brings a degree of focus to the task. And it's so easy to lose that focus with uh, emails, with reports that need to be done, with uh, what the boss is asking you to do. So it is quite helpful on occasion to reorient yourself with a nice short synopsis of like that, um, that one that we just mentioned, and to uh, reevaluate your activities. Cassio says that, uh, he mentions that HR provides specialized expertise in areas like recruiting, staffing, retention, training and development, and then it's the line managers or the operating managers that use this expertise to manage people effectively. I completely agree with that. Um, as, as you know, we teach this class, Managing Human Resources, aimed more at the, uh, the regular manager or general manager. We're not trying to teach this course as if um, we're training you all to be human resource practitioners. But I think that's a good synopsis. Each area in a company, operations managers, marketing managers, finance managers, all have specialized expertise. And uh, HR managers are the same way or should be. And uh, if it's a smaller company that doesn't have an HR staff, certainly HR consultants can offer some of this expertise. Um, I have noticed through the years when I worked uh, in the industry that some of the managers that seem to me to be the most astute uh, or the most smart were the ones that were willing to admit when they didn't know something and seek out the expertise. It seemed quite smart to me when line managers would approach us in HR or in training, present a situation that they were dealing with or a, a goal that they were trying to achieve and enlisted our support from an HR perspective, how we could support what they were trying to achieve. So certainly that made us happy because the managers that didn't do that tended to have more problems which would boil up into bigger problems that we would have to solve. Plus it's nice to be consulted and to um, be able to assist. So I think uh, that's a pretty pretty good indicator of healthy management style when you do seek out and use expertise uh, rather than waiting until you've got a big problem on your hands and uh, really need the expertise. On page 9, Cassio talks about the adoption of high performing, uh, excuse me, high performance work practices and that relates back to what I had said earlier about the softer courses and that uh, the fact that um, managing people is a critical role for every manager. Um, we do now know that um, you can measure the results from effective HRM practices and I think this pops up several times in the book but uh, specifically in chapter one he points out that up to forty-five thousand dollars per employee can be generated by the adoption of these high performance work practices and it can increase a firm's probability of survival by 22%. I think those are pretty significant numbers. Those numbers seem quite credible to me. They don't seem exaggerated. I'm familiar with the studies upon which those numbers are based, and they're uh, 
they were well done studies. Um, so I think that does indicate that um, it is really important, in some cases vitally important, to pay attention to our human resource practices and to pay attention to what are the best practices, what are the research supported practices, and to adopt those practices in our organizations. I'd like to emphasize what Cassio says on page 10. He says that, actually I will quote him, HR systems have important practical impacts on the survival and financial performance of firms and on the productivity and quality of work life of the people in them. I think that's a really important statement that he makes and I completely agree with that. If you would think for a moment, uh, there's still certainly some industries in firms in the U.S. that are capital intensive. Um, Evra's Rocky Mountain Steel, south of Pueblo, uh, right there in Pueblo, I-25, that gigantic, somewhat ugly steel plant, is a, a good example of a capital intensive industry. And that company is a very valuable part of the Pueblo economy. And that company makes a lot of money every year. We're fortunate to have them here. but. Many of those type of firms and industries have uh, ended up moving offshore and a lot of the companies that you hear the most buzz about nowadays, Google, uh, a lot of the communication, internet companies, Facebook, um, Apple, on and on, tend to be less capital intensive and their competitive advantage uh, is for the most part based on intellectual capital. So what's up here? in the minds of employees and what they can do with that, what they can create, innovate. And I really think it's important to uh, emphasize what Cassio says, that it's important to create an environment that makes the best people want to stay. So if you have these brilliant people that are coming up with the innovations, and even some of the, not necessarily brilliant, but good contributors, hard workers, uh, good performers, you definitely want to ensure that your work environment and your HR practices are creating an environment these people want to stay in. Last thing you want to do is poorly manage your company, treat people in a way that they want to leave and have your best people end up working for a competitor. And oftentimes it will be the best people who do leave because they're the ones most able to leave. At the same time, I would point out that um, you know you want the best people to stay. Sometimes you don't want the not so good people to stay. So some turnover is functional. You may have uh, typically thought of turnover as a bad thing, and it typically is a bad thing. You generally don't want turnover. It's very expensive to hire, a recruit, hire, orient, train newcomers. It's uh, definitely expensive. But um, I do agree with the, the folks who have written about some degree of turnover can be functional, especially if it is the people who are less effective. And some companies have really gone to extremes. We'll talk about this in future chapters to, uh, to make sure that they do weed out the less effective performers. On page 16, Cassio talks about uh, the fact that leaders need to focus laser-like attention on attracting, deploying, and keeping a workforce that is, is as good or better than that of the competition. I really love that characterization. I totally agree with it. Why don't we look at our workforce as a source of competitive advantage? We should look at them that way. We think about technology, location, um, finances, ability to generate ideas, all of those things are sources of competitive advantage, but I think one of the most fundamental sources of competitive advantage is the workforce. So I think uh, you should adopt that mindset that it's your job, whatever department that you work in, to focus some laser-like attention on attracting, deploying, and keeping a workforce that is as good or better than that of the competition. You definitely can play a role in that. I would like to conclude by talking a little bit about uh, what Cassio lists is on uh, page 26 and 27 if you'd like to follow along with me. He says uh, management 
systems that produce profits through people share seven dimensions and he lists those seven dimensions. So employment security. In other words, uh, if employees are constantly being downsized and rehired, obviously that's not employment security. Insecurity, uh, uncertainty is a stressor. Uncertainty about outcomes that are important to us generate stress. Oftentimes stress can drain cognitive resources. If we're stressed at work, sometimes that's a good thing. That can motivate us to focus. But ongoing stress can be a distraction. It can undermine health. And job insecurity, I think, is one of the most prevalent sources of, of uncertainty and stress nowadays. So certainly it makes sense to me why employment security would be a source of competitive advantage. Not surprised to see it at all as one of the seven. Obviously, too, if you retain an effective workforce, these people learn things over time, which contributes to that resource that we talked about earlier, intellectual capital. Second uh, item on the list is selective hiring, and uh, that makes complete sense. You want to hire the best people. You want to be in a position where you can select the best people and not have to take who you can get. And again, uh, that relates back to quality of work life and HRM practices. If you have a good work environment, that information will spread through word of mouth. Em uh, employees will talk, people in the community, friends and relatives will hear, and the number of applicants that uh, seek to work at your organization will increase. It's really a competitive advantage to be seen as a best place to work. And uh, most individuals uh, in a certain community know which organizations in town have reputations as the best place to work. Selective hiring also depends on effective selection practices, and we'll talk about some of those in later chapters, but certainly uh, you've got to have the right methods for sorting through all these applicants to truly indeed hire the people who have the skills abilities and uh, other characteristics that you need. Third on the list is uh, self-managed teams and decentralization. Probably could uh, split those two up, but um, it's not essential to have self-managing teams to um, have an effective organization, but I think just the research supports that many of the most effective organizations do have, tend to have self-managing teams and it you can reduce layers of supervision and management, reduce overhead. If you have teams of employees who don't need a lot of oversight, a lot of close supervision and can make decisions for themselves and take action. And that again would contribute to decentralization. Decentralization means that decisions can made, be made more quickly. They can be made by people who are closer to the problems and issues and the information and things can be done quicker. I think fourth on the list, comparatively high compensation contingent on organizational performance. I think it's important to talk about that a little bit and then explain it. Comparatively high compensation, what that means is compared to the market, compared to the other organizations in the area with whom you would compete for employees that you pay probably above market, you pay more, a lot more or a little more. enough more to make a difference. Um, again, that will increase the number of people who want to work at your organization. It will help you with retention. It will promote good mindset of employees when they do compare pay with people, uh, uh, other people in similar jobs or other people outside the organization, they'll see that they're paid fairly. So it's kind of an equity issue that, hey, these guys pay me fair, I should give them a fair return. A fair day's work for a fair day's pay. Um, and it will help you retain. It will be tougher for other organizations to pick off or recruit uh, some of your best people if they're paid uh, well. I think the part about comparatively high compensation contingent on organizational performance, that latter half of the point is quite important. A lot of companies, and this is nothing new, it was new 15 years ago, a lot of companies had moved to uh, make more of the pay contingent on results, so less of your pay nowadays 
tends to be based on uh, this base pay or this amount you're going to get every month. So companies have made more of employees pay contingent on results, whether it's organizational real results or individual results. So to be clear, if you think back, the pure case of this that's been around forever is uh, salespeople whose pay is m completely or mostly based on uh, commissions. So the more they sell, the more they make. That's an extreme example, but organizations kind of retooled and looked at all employees and said, we can motivate these employees better if we get them more focused on results. We want them focused on what our strategic objectives are, what our goals are. We want that to be a salient part of what's going on in their minds when they're at work. And they found that people tend to pay attention to what they're paid for. So if my pay is based on uh, certain things, and it's going to vary based on those various things, I definitely pay attention to that. So uh, organizations tended to reduce the percentage of pay that was uh, base pay that you would get every month no matter what, and made more of the pay called at risk, where if the uh, employee and the company did well, uh, pay was good. If the employee and or the company performed poorly, pay wasn't so good. I think that's um, it's quite a different move than what it was 20 years ago. It's pretty radical, um, pretty effective, I think. And uh, obviously when you move to something like that, it's got to be administered carefully, but certainly will focus employees' attention in the direction of what you want them to be focused on. The next item in the list was effective training, excuse me, extensive training, which would need to be effective as well. So these companies that tend to be more effective invest extensively in training. I know in um, prior semesters I've had at least one student that was kind of uh, perplexed that we spent a whole chapter, a whole, um, whole night on training. Uh, that's easily understandable to me, but it makes complete sense to me that training needs to be one of the chapters that we cover. The best organizations, as I mentioned, invest heavily in training. They see it as a source of competitive advantage and the research bears that out. Billions of dollars are wasted every year on ineffective training. We don't want to do that. When you spend your precious organizational funds on training, you want to get a good return on investment. So we'll talk about some ways to do that later in the course. And let's see, the next item is reduced differences in status. Um, term is status differentials. Big differences in status between the top manager and the lower level employee, CEO versus lower level employees. Um, I don't know how it has traditionally been in other countries. I know in the U.S. in a lot of organizations there were the big differences in status. The CEOs had the huge fancy offices and the world headquarters on the top floor that only certain people could get to. Even the, There would be even status differentials among secretaries. So the CEO's secretary had a really nice office, lots of room. And I uh, can give an example of this. Uh, I used to work at Ford when I was a young person working in HR. and. Um, at the manufacturing plant I worked at, the hourly employees, so the, the line workers, the guys that assembled and worked on our products, had to park way, way away from the plant in the hourly parking lot, some giant lot, and they would walk into the plant. And in uh, Michigan winters, that could be a cold, unpleasant walk through the snow. I was a salaried employee, so I got to park in the uh, parking lot uh, right across from the plant, right next to the plant, I would have to walk over a railroad track um, through the site to get there, but relatively close. The uh, managers at my plant parked in uh, right up against the plant. Uh, there was an overhang of the building so they could park under there. The cars wouldn't get snowed on in the winter, and uh, all they had to do was hop out of the car, and there was a door pretty close by to go into. And then uh, the top manager at our plant, the plant manager, 
actually had a heated parking garage that was built into the plant. Kind of crazy, but um, so he had a remote control to make his garage door open up, and it was uh, heated to keep his uh, Lincoln warm so that uh, nice and comfy when he got off work. So again, there was an hourly cafeteria where the hourly employees ate. There was a much smaller salaried cafeteria where people like me ate, and then there was a management cafeteria, a nice fancy little cafeteria. So a lot of status differentials in that organization. Um, that can work. Ford has been a pretty effective company, depending on your viewpoint. Um, so those, there's various org, organizational cultures that can work, but I think the evidence does suggest that when you can break down these status differences, um, there tends to be more communication among workers. Employees and managers share information more effectively. Um, I guess on the plus side, these gradated status differentials do generate competition sometimes healthy, sometimes unhealthy for people wanting to move up in status and perks and benefits. But uh, in general, uh, my intuition, my gut, my preferences is for less status differentials. And uh, evidence supports the uh, benefits of breaking down some of those barriers between management and employees. Uh, sharing the information is the last item on the list. And I think obviously that is essential and that's something I just mentioned related to breaking down the status differentials. So anything we can do to share information, learn more quickly, share lessons learned among different locations, among different employees and managers. So it's actually learning. There's a whole literature on learning organizations and I think it's quite important to learn effectively make use of information, share information, and everybody knows that there's way too much information, there's information overload uh, nowadays, but that's nothing new. People have been saying that for 20 years at least. Um, but it's quite a, quite a lot of stimuli that hit us every day, so focusing in and sharing information that's important certainly would be a source of competitive advantage. All right, that concludes chapter one. I hope you enjoy reading the chapter, and I'll be very interested in learning what jumps out at you, what's salient to you from Cassio. You undoubtedly will spot some other things that are meaningful to you. That's good. Uh, it's interesting that people can read the same chapter, and because of our backgrounds and experiences, we spot different things that seem to be important to us, so please uh, do that. S spot what's important to you. Think about it write about it. Let me know what you got out of chapter one.